Dr. Ted was one of the most admired art professionals in the world. But he was much more than that. You're lucky if you meet that caliber of a man once in a decade, once in two decades. Now, in the autumn of 2009, he flew over from the United States to the Vera Peninsula to have a meeting with John Kingerly. And I went down to join them to interview Dr. Ted for the Sunday Business Post. Now, in terms of, of an interview, the journalist is in exactly the same position as a house painter. Not an artist, a house painter. Preparation is everything. You don't know what kind of mood your interviewee is going to be in. You don't know if he's going to be drunk or sober. You don't know if he's going to give you two minutes or two hours. So you've got to do your homework. Uh, the shortest interview I ever had was when they sent me to interview Steve Jobs at Apple. <laughs> and he was so rude, I stood it for three minutes, said thank you, and walked out. In that case, the homework didn't do me any good at all. Now, when I came to research Dr. Ted, I thought I knew a fair bit about him. You know, I, 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 you know through the years I've picked up this and that but I was blown away by the sheer breadth of his accomplishments. Now, I'm not going to list them. We'd be here all night if I did that. Suffice to say, he probably made his international reputation when he was director of the Kimball Gallery in mm -hmm. Fort Worth in Texas. Over 18 years, he amassed a collection of old masters, impressionists, modern masters, that's now considered to be one of the finest collections in the United States. The French gave him a knighthood, which he accepted. The British asked him to be director of the National Gallery, which he declined. When the Russians discovered that the Hermitage was literally falling down, falling apart, UNESCO brought in Dr. Ted to sort them out, and he became the chairman for the advisory board to secure the future of the Hermitage. Dr. Ted was fascinated by John's very odd techniques. He makes paintings like no other artist I've ever known. Um, he was a bit taken aback at the humble kind of lifestyle the pair had. He, he took in the, the self-sufficiency, the vegetable garden. He noticed John's only luxury was a television set. And he also noticed a box set of The Wire. <laughs> and that told him that John didn't live in some sort of airy fairy ivory tower doing his art. He was really plugged into real life and what life is like away from tranquil places like the Beira Peninsula. Now sometime over those two days, John and Mo took us to an even more remote cottage they had lived in when they first came to Ireland. Now this place had no electricity, no water. It was a mile and a half up a really steep hill. The Kingleys didn't have a car, so everything they needed, food, fuel, everything, had to be carried, humped up this hill. And that really impressed Dr. Ted. That gave him an insight to what was going on in John's mind. And at the end of the two days, when Kingerley and Dr. Ted had said their goodbyes, the two of us sat down with my tape recorder to do the formal interview. And Dr. Ted talked for two hours solid. I actually ran out of tapes and had to scribble like a maniac. He was so fired up by what he'd seen in the two days. And what I'm going to do is, is read you some excerpts from that tape transcript. He began by explaining what first sparked his interest. He said, I first saw John's work some years ago in a private collection and thought it to be of exceptional quality. One of the things I noticed back then was the small scale of his paintings, some of them painted on boards the size of a book. Of course, traditionally, artists who paint on a small scale are perceived to have small vision, and I was curious to find out if that was the case, he was an artist of small ideas or if he'd something more important to say. Having observed him at work, in my view, he's one of the most important and certainly one of the most talented artists working today. 